Hi, I'm Oliver Landy, I'm an automotive photographer, and in this video I'm going through why I think the 85mm is the best lens for automotive photography. So briefly I'm going to talk about why I think the 85mm is the best lens in general, and then uh, then going to speak a little bit about this, this one in specific, which I think is the creme de la creme of all 85mm lenses. So why 85mm? So, Generally, when it comes to car photography, 85mm gives you enough reach and it's a tight enough angle that you it's easier to isolate the car from the other things that are going on around it, especially if you can't control the environment as much as you would like. So if you're at events or you don't have a lot of space to work with, the, the tighter the focal length, the, 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 the easier it is to get rid of distractions just by having a tighter crop. That's number one. Number two is that you get nice compression and usually depth of field. Now, um, compression and depth of field is an optical thing, um, but effectively the outcome is you, if you want to, you can separate your subject from the background by making the background go blurry. I'll put up some examples now, both of general full, full car shots and uh, some detail shots um, of uh, wheels and things like that, just so you can see how much that subject pops out when you can blur the background. Now, the lower the maximum aperture is of your lens, the easier it is to get this effect. And the generally speaking, if you're going to be using an 85 mil prime, then uh, even the entry level ones uh, start off at kind of 1.8, which is pretty fast uh, or pretty wide open aperture wise. And the, the top end ones like this one go up open to 1.2, which is even more so. That's a big part of why I like the 85. Additionally, um, if you find yourself in a situation where you want to get a wider shot than your 85 would be able to, so you, you get there, you've got this angle, it works really well, but it's just too tight for, too wide for your 85. There's nothing stopping you from doing a, a panorama or a Brennheiser, and that gives you that wider angle perspective and also keeps that really nice compression and depth of field effect that you get from the 85 when you're shooting wide open. Um, but you still get the wider view. Whereas if you're using a wider angle view to start with, something like a 35 uh, or a 24, something like that, then you it's much, much harder to get that same appearance, that same uh, aesthetic of a shallow depth of field on a wider angle. Whereas if you use a panorama with the 85, then you still maintain that depth of field. And, you, and I'll put up a few examples of that now. So all of these were shot using a panorama to, or a panoramic technique in order to get a wider angle, but maintain that depth of field. It's one of my go-to um, techniques for capturing cars um, because you get both the wide angle and the shallow depth of field. So. One of the competitors for an 85 is a 200 mil, and a lot of people have the 70 to 200, 2.8, and at 200 millimeters at 2.8, the depth of field is, is similar to an 85 at 1.8 or 1.2 or 1.4. Um, and so, uh, and you get the versatility of having the zoom. So the, the only downside to, to using a 200 millimeter is that you have to be so much further back from your subject to get it all in the frame that your your working distance gets quite long and you may or may not always have that much space especially if you're photographing kind of out in the real world you know uh, either at car meets or um you know uh, country lanes and things like that places where getting that kind of distance away from the car might be a challenge um, whereas with the 85 the the, dis the working distance is closer um, but you still get that kind of compression and shallow depth of field effect um, I have used both and I realized after a while that um, once I got my new 85, I basically stopped using the 7200 almost completely. Um, and so now I just use the 85 pretty much exclusively. Okay, so onto this beastie, the Canon RF 85 1.2. Now obviously I shoot Canon. Um, there are various different 85s out there, not only for Canon, but also for all the other um, manufacturers as well. Generally, you're going to start off at an 85 1.8. It's going to be the kind of entry level uh, 85mm. Then there's normally a 1.4 and then uh, Canon does 1.2 and I believe some of the others do a 1.2 as well. Um, so this is an absolute monster of a lens. You can sort of see how huge that front element is. And um, there's lots of reasons why I love this lens. Um, and I'm gonna go through them now kind of point by point. So the first one is that it is tack sharp 
even wide open. It's so much sharper than my previous 85, uh, and that was pretty sharp to start with. Um, it blows all my other lenses out of the water, um, or it did when I got it, and it, it's just unreal to be able to shoot wide open at 1.2 and images to be tack sharp, it's amazing. Obviously, the big elephant in the room, it opens up to 1.2 and shooting at 1.2 is unreal. If you've never done it, if you've never had that kind of compression, that kind of shallow depth of field, then it's so worth trying, even if you only rent one, just to see what it's like and if, and if it's gonna be something that you want and something that you use. I probably overuse it, I love it that much. Um, I'll put up a whole bunch of examples now of 1.2 images, they're just awesome. So another thing is kind of a slightly geeky technical thing. Um, there's something called chromatic aberration, which is effectively whenever you get a light uh, area of a photo up against a dark area of a photo. Um, so, you know, the, where the skyline meets or something like that, you can get something called chromatic aberration, which is effectively where there's some distortion and it creates this kind of purple orange banding around the edges of things. Um, and it was really, really bad in the in the EF 1.285 millimeter. And it's quite common in cheaper lenses. And there's almost none of it in this. I've never noticed it in any of the images when I shoot with this lens. So it's just another thing that's amazing about it. And this one's kind of a weird one. It looks like a beast and it is. And when you turn up to photo shoots and you pull this bad boy out, people can just look by the size of it that it means business. And there's a weird perception with people where um, the average person doesn't necessarily understand the difference between certain cameras, especially as modern cameras, mirrorless cameras are getting smaller and smaller. That whole like pulling out a massive, you know, uh, camera and it kind of immediately labeling you as someone who knows what they're doing, or at least someone who has pro level gear, um, isn't so easy to do these days. But when you pull something like this out um, and people see the sheer size of it, um, it kind of automatically labels it as, as a high end bit of gear, even to a novice, which, um, you know, it, it's not a big deal, but perceptions do matter and um, looking like you have the right gear in the top end gear um, just adds to your uh, the perception of you as a photographer. I'm sure there's lots of other things that I'm uh, forgetting about this lens uh, at the moment but there are some cons as well. Um, so one is that uh, it is quite heavy, um, you know, it's a bit of a chunky bit of glass and it can actually, um, when you attach it to a mirrorless camera, which is what it is, the RF mount, um, it can actually feel like quite front heavy. So if you've got a battery grip, that will help to counteract the weight of it. But otherwise, just be prepared for the fact it's a ch chunky old lens. Another thing is there's no stabilization with this lens, um, which isn't a deal breaker these days with uh, you know, most of the modern mirrorless body bodies having uh, stabilization, the R6, the R5, the e, R3. I'm sure from now on most of them will, if not all of them, um, and that can go a long way to, to give you that little bit of extra stability, um, and it even works with, um, with video as well. Um, but not having stabilization in the lens um, compared to um, you know, some of the other lenses you can get out there, or 70 to 200, 28, that kind of thing, um, it might make a difference to you if you're gonna be doing a lot of low light or um, uh, video work. And finally, uh, it's the, the big, big problem with this. It is eye-wateringly expensive. Uh, in the UK, it's £2,700 for this bad boy, and that is a lot of money to drop on a single lens. Um, the, the reason why I ended up doing it was I looked at my Lightroom catalogue and realised that over 85%, ironically, of all of my images were shot on the 85mm focal length, so why not, um, if I'm going to be using it the most, if it's the, my most used lens, why not get the best one that I possibly can? Um, so that was my thinking behind it. Uh, I don't regret buying it at all. It is, It has been my, a workhorse and uh, I do get a lot of people commenting about uh, my images and, and the overall aesthetic of them. And for the, uh, you know, the photo illiterate or photographic muggles, um, they, 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 they can't understand what they're looking at or they don't understand what they're looking at. They just see the difference between a really sharp, high contrast, really good color, um, really shallow depth of field image um, and one that say not as doesn't have as much of those qualities and they'll just pick it out as looking better so um, yeah no absolutely I, I, I don't regret it at all and I still use it for almost everything because it's that good so you don't need to start with something like this. Uh, any 85 mil prime will be a, a really good lens for you, especially if you're sort of taking that first step into full frame and uh, you're looking to get a bit of a lens kit. I would say that, you know, if you're, 
if you insist on having zooms and, and you've got your 24 to 70 and a wide angle, uh, this could easily be your first prime. Get, getting an 85 mil prime will open up lots of uh, options for you, both for portraiture and automotive photography and all sorts of other things as well. Um, so uh, yeah, can't recommend the 85 enough. And uh, if anyone wants to tell me how wrong I am, then do so in the comments. If you've got any other features of this lens that I've missed, do tell me as well. And uh, if you have got something from this video, then do drop me a like. And if you want to see more from me, then subscribe to my channel. If you want to see more of the work that I've captured with this lens, then do check me out on Instagram. It's Oliver underscore Lundy underscore photography. And do hit me up there. I do try to answer as many people as I can. And I'll see you in the next one.